Let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Father in heaven, it is a privilege to come together as believers in your Son. And as we've come here to, to study your word, to fellowship with one another, and to be equipped, we pray that your Spirit would be here. May he illuminate our understanding as we study together in fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. The goal, as I mentioned before with Faith FM, is about our official little mission statement is connecting Australia with the life-changing, everlasting, what's the last word? Gospel. And when I, 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 I say that to people, especially administrators and things like that, everyone gets very comfortable because we all know that our job is to do what? Share the gospel. But you know what I've found as I travel the country and I talk to people, I like to be a bit of, bit of a, a stirrer. I like to say, what's the gospel? What's the gospel? And it's funny because everyone I ask, I get different answers. And yet we're all thinking that we're all meaning the same thing when we say what? The gospel. Now, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up a Christian. And so I, I had to, to learn the gospel. And sometimes I find as I travel around and I talk to people who have sometimes grown up in the Christian faith, they've assumed what the gospel is. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to share with you five things that build up the theme of what the gospel is. And these are the five things I want you to be able to leave here today and be able to share. Five things. How many things? Five. Now, because this is you know, me and I'm on the radio, I want to give you a radio experience. So take out your phone right now, and I want you to save this number in your contacts, because at the end of the episode today, the end of the what? I've got a giveaway for you, and you'll need your phone to text in for today's free giveaway. So take out your phone right now. This is the only time you can do it in church, legally. Save the number 04888 That's the show number for the faith experiment. 04888 Just save that number. At the end, I'm going to give you a special code to text to that number. And then I'm going to reply to you with a response in real time. So 04888 Let's get started. I want to take you to the first book written in the Bible after the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is the first book. Now, the first book in your Bible is Matthew, isn't it? In the New Testament, it's Matthew. But the reality is the first book ever written after Jesus ascended was actually the Gospel of Mark. We say Gospel because Gospel means what? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. You're Victorians. Good news. So this is the good news according to Mark. First book ever written. Around 55 AD it was written. And in the opening part of this verse, of this book, the very first verse, notice what it says. It says, the beginning of the gospel of who? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So the opening remarks in the new Christian era, the very first inspired words to be written down on pen and paper is this. This is the beginning of the gospel. What's gospel mean? Good news. Of who? Jesus Christ. Notice that the good news is always of something. It's attached to something. You can't just have good news. It has to be attached to something. What's the good news attached to in this passage? To Jesus. So if we want to understand what the gospel is and how many things we're looking for, five, we have to understand why is Jesus good news? That makes sense, doesn't it? If that's the beginning of the good news, why is Jesus the good news? Why is he the gospel? So we're going to look at what Jesus says the gospel is. In the same passage, same chapter, you jump down to verse 14. Now, there have been 13 verses in Mark chapter 1 at this point. The very first one says this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then it goes into the story about um, John the Baptist. And then you get down to verse four, uh, 13, and Jesus has already been baptized. He's already gone to the wilderness. He's been there for 40 days. He's dealt with the devil, and then he comes back out. And now we're in verse 14. 
Do you know in Matthew's gospel, that took four chapters to tell. Mark is a speed writer. He's trying to tell this story urgently and quick uh, and, and thoroughly, but urgently and quickly. So we get to this passage here in verse 14. Jesus has come out of the wilderness, and this is what it says in verse 14. It says, Now after John was put into prison, Jesus came to where? Galilee, preaching what? The gospel. What's gospel mean? Good news. So Jesus comes out of the, out of the wilderness, and he starts preaching or proclaiming the good news. But the gospel or good news has to always be attached to something. It's about something. Now, let's ask Jesus, Jesus, what's the good news you're preaching? Notice what he says. Mark says that he came out preaching the good news of the what? Kingdom of God. Now, if I had have had the chance to survey you all before we started today and asked you to define what is the gospel, you would very, I would very, very be, I'd be very, very surprised if most of you, if not all of you, did not mention the word kingdom. Because most of us, when we say the word gospel, we think we're talking about Jesus dying on the cross. Is that right? And is that good news? Yeah, it is. But when Jesus came out of the wilderness and he, he says, I've got something to proclaim, something to preach, they said, what is it? He said, what I've got good news about is about what? The kingdom of God. Now, for a 21st century person like you and I are, that's not really exciting, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was in Victoria. I thought you guys were noisy down here. Is it exciting that there's good news about the kingdom? You're all faking it now. We're not really excited about it because kingdom doesn't mean anything to us today. Because we didn't live in 27 AD. Let me ask you, now this is dangerous, but let me ask you something. Let's do a little psychological game. If I say this word, I want you to tell me what are the sort of things that come to mind. COVID. What? Lockdowns. What else? Daniel Andrews, okay. <laughs> Over here, what was that? COVID, what do you, what do you think of? Vaccines. Vaccines, what else? Masks, what else? Isolation, what else? Zoom, okay. So here's the point. We're not getting political, all right? But here's the point. When I use the word COVID in 2022, we all have ideas and feelings and thoughts associated with that word. Are you with me? I guarantee you, for the last two years, when you got together, illegally, <laughs> not necessarily illegally, but you know, you're walking a dog this way and your friend happens to be walking a dog the same way, whatever the case is, right? When you got together, every time you saw someone, you were talking about what topic? COVID. All those different areas, lockdowns, mandates, all that stuff. If you lived in 27 AD, and you said, COVID, nobody have a clue what you're talking about. The same way that in 22, 2022, when someone says kingdom, we have no idea what you're talking about. But in 27 AD, when Jesus has come out of the wilderness and he says, I've got good news about the kingdom, everyone's got five things. There are five things attached to the word kingdom in 27 AD. Five things. Here they are. Number one, when you hear the word kingdom in 27 AD, the very first thing that comes to mind is the promised king to come. You mention the word kingdom, immediately, where, where's the promised one? Who's the promised one? Where's the promised one? Because who was king in 27 AD? Was there a king of Israel in the proper sense of the word? Not talking about Herod the puppet king. Nobody recognized him as the Israelite. Was there a king of Israel? No. When was the last king of Israel? You know your Bible. That's a good answer. A long time ago. <laughs> Do you know your Bibles? 
You're supposed to be people of the book. Okay, let me, let's, let's work backwards. Who was in control in 27 AD of Israel? Rome. Who was in charge of Israel before Rome? Greece. Before Daniel 2, you remember that story? What was before Greece? Come on. Meet a Persia. And before Meet a Persia, who was it? Why? Because Babylon took the king captive. Do you remember this part of the Bible? This is what the kids get taught in Sabbath school, and you all forget when you get old. Dementia. <laughs> I didn't say that, he did. So here's the point. When the children of Israel were taken captive and went into Babylon, they were longing for the day to come back out of captivity and get their king. Remember the prophecy to David? Your son, the root of David, will rule for how long? Forever. What about Isaiah? What about Malachi? Zechariah? All these prophecies of the coming king. Now, 27 AD is almost, it's about 550 years since Babylon took the king captive. Could you imagine you had two, two years thereabouts of COVID lockdown type stuff? Could you imagine having that for 550 years? Every generation, every generation is going, when's the promised king coming? When's the promised king coming? When's the promised king coming? Now, here's the second point. Why do they want a promised king? Why are they looking for the promised king? Because the promised king will do the job of a king. Kings, in those days at least, they would rescue and redeem their people. They would fight for their subjects. That was the good kings. Abraham is the first real king of Israel. And when his, his subjects were taken captive and carried off there by those, those rascals in the area, what did the king do? What did, what did Abraham do? He went and got his servants, trained them up, and they went out and fought and rescued and redeemed. And so Israel has been looking for their promised king to rescue and what? Redeem them. From who? From Babylon. Then who? Me to Persia. Come on, Daniel 2 still. And then who? Greece. And then now in 27 AD, who is it? Rome. When you say kingdom, people are sitting around going, when's the promised king coming? Oh, I heard there was a guy out there called Bar-Jesus. He might be the promised king. But when he comes, he might need a, a, a team, an army to help to rescue and redeem, to fight with. So why don't we get some swords and some spears? Why don't we start practicing? You see, in 27 AD, there's a lot of false kings on the horizon. You can read about all the Jesuses that showed up around that time. When you're looking at rescue and redeemers, there was a whole bunch of people that said, we need to help train right now so that when he shows up, we can fight with them. They call themselves the zealots. You ever heard of them? So what else do they think of when they think of the kingdom? The third thing is the rule of law in the kingdom. For a 27 AD Israelite, the law was, God's law I'm talking about here, was absolutely trampled upon by their, their captive, um, captives, uh, captors, I should say. Their law, their Sabbaths were dis disregarded by the, by the Romans or the, the Medes and Persians or the Greeks or whoever it was at the time. And as a result, because God's law was not uplifted, subjects in the kingdom had no justice and they had no freedom. Because no one's keeping the law, anybody can steal. So now there's no freedom. But also because they can steal, there's no justice. And so for the people of Israel, they are longing for God's law to be exalted in the land. And in order to make that happen, a group of religious people got together and said, hey, maybe if we make sure that nobody breaks God's laws, if we keep the laws perfectly for seven weeks and seven perfect Sabbaths, maybe then the king will come and rescue and redeem us. They were called Pharisees. 
They wanted the law to be exalted in the kingdom so that Messiah would come. The zealots thought if we train hard enough, then Messiah will come and we'll fight with him as his servants. 27 AD, the word kingdom. Number four, you can't talk about a kingdom without talking about the subjects. And for the 27 AD Israelite, that was a really easy question to answer. Who are the subjects of the kingdom? Well, that's us. The descendants of who? Come on now, who? Abraham. That's why when 27 AD, when Jesus shows up, guess who the Jews don't like? Everybody else. We don't like those Samaritans. They're our cousins, but they got mixed up and messed up and they've, they've desecrated the law. And so we definitely aren't going to have a king over them and we want nothing to do with them. They're not the pure people. And those, those, those pesky people over there in the, in the West, those Greeks and those Gentiles and those Romans, they're dogs. I mean, they had a name for everyone. The, four, uh, the fifth and final thing when they heard the word kingdom was the place. A kingdom has to have territory. And in 27 AD, they are looking for the land of Israel to be once again exalted on the world platform as the kingdom which has the people, which has the law, which had been redeemed by the promised king. So that's why in 27 AD, in fact, going all the way back for 500 years, if you went to Friday night Shabbat and you had dinner with your neighbors, You'd be sitting around talking about, hey, have you heard? There's a guy in the next village, Bar Jesus. Maybe he is the promised king. Well, I don't know about that. I haven't seen it on the, the CNN news yet. My rabbi says it might not be him. My rabbi says it might be him. If you went to the temple, they're reading from the law, trying to get you to be obedient so that Messiah, the promised king, will come. All of society was functioning around this idea of the king, the kingdom, the people, the places, the law. This was the topic of the talk of the town. Now, Jesus shows up in 27 AD and he comes out of the wilderness and he says, I've got good news. What? The kingdom. What? What? The promised king, rescue, redemption, the rule of law, freedom, justice, the people, us, the place. The problem is, Jesus didn't say he had good news about the kingdom, did he? What did he say in your Bible? Because I know you have your Bibles open. That's right. Jesus said, I've got good news about the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Israel. But they were excited. There was enthusiasm. And I believe, in fact, you can see it in the scripture, for three and a half years, Jesus was trying to communicate the good news about the kingdom of God. And right to the very end, you know what those disciples thought? What did they think? You tell me. They thought Jesus was here for the kingdom of Israel. You don't believe me? Do you know what they were fighting about right before Jesus dies on a cross? Who will be the greatest in the kingdom when it's restored? What was the last thing the disciples said to Jesus as he was ascending on the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1? The disciples turned to Jesus is about to leave. They turned to Jesus. You can read in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 10, all the way down to verse 14. This is what they say to Jesus. Lord, is it now the time that you will restore the kingdom of Israel? They had been with Jesus for three and a half years, and they still didn't get what the gospel was. They're waiting for those pesky Romans to be dealt with. The same way their forefathers were waiting for those pesky Greeks. And before that, it was the Medo-Persians. Before that, it was the Babylonians. And today, it's dictator Dan. We're always waiting for something to happen, for the gospel to happen. I want to show you very quickly in the time we have this morning. Why did Jesus come out and use a term that they had a misunderstanding on? Let's have a look. The very first thing is of this idea of the kingdom 
is the promised king, right? I want you to notice what Jesus says. So Mark has told us that he said he's preaching the good news of the kingdom of God and saying. Now Mark is quoting Jesus. Mark wasn't there probably, but Mark is quoting Peter who was there. And this is what Mark says. That is super blurry. Was it my eyes? It says, and saying, so this is Jesus speaking, saying what? The time is fulfilled. The very first part of Jesus' gospel message about the kingdom of God is that the time is fulfilled. You know what he's talking about? No? He's talking about prophecy. The very first thing out of Jesus' mouth, very first thing recorded in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus comes out of the world and says, listen, I'm going to point you to the prophecies because the prophecy has been fulfilled. What year is this? He's saying it. 27 AD. What had just happened 40 days before? He was baptized. Jesus has just been baptized. And now he says to the world, the time is fulfilled. What are you talking about, Jesus? He is quoting from the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, this is why Seventh-day Adventists ought to know their prophecies. Because it pinpoints who Messiah is and ultimately pinpoints why you're sitting on these chairs and not chairs tomorrow. Because of prophecy. It's God's signature. Notice what Daniel was told by Gabriel. He says, 70 weeks we turn upon your people. Blah, 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 blah. You all know this part. When he gets down to this part here, he says, and to, uh, um, and to seal up the prophecy, this is the 70-week prophecy, and to what? Anoint the most holy. You see, Daniel was told the exact time that the Messiah, the most holy, would be anointed, which means the anointed is the chosen or the Christ. Daniel was told exactly when this is going to happen. And if you know your, your, your prophecies and your dates and figures and all that good stuff, if you don't talk to your pastors, and if they don't, tell the president. We've got to know why we believe what we believe. So Jesus comes along and says, listen, the time's fulfilled. I'm here. I'm here. The time is fulfilled. I, the, what, what's the, what are you talking about, Jesus? The time for the anointing of the most holy is fulfilled. Notice what the book of Acts describes the anointing of Jesus. He says he went through Galilee and got what? Baptized. And that was God anointing Jesus, the Messiah, with the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes out of the wilderness and says, listen, the time's fulfilled. The prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 is fulfilled. And you know what that means? I am the Christ, the anointed. You know what that means? The promised king has come. Oh, come on. Someone should say amen. amen. The promised king has come. You're not waiting for him to come. Obviously, we are in a second form, but he's been. Oh, man, you guys are hard. <laughs> the promised king has come. That's the very first thing Jesus says. Listen, I've got good news. The kingdom of God is here. The time is fulfilled. <sighs> These guys are better. Now, if that is what Jesus is communicating, that he is the promised one, the very next thing he should do in this idea of what the kingdom is, he should do redeeming, rescuing. That's what he should do next. Did he fight the Romans? No. Did he fight anybody else? No. Notice what he did do. Notice what the Bible says. This is in Matthew's account. This is the passage we've just read in Matthew's version in chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus began to preach saying, repent for what? The kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God are interchangeable. So it's the same context. What Mark just showed us where he said, the time is fulfilled. This is the same thing that Mark, uh, Matthew's picking up here. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is here. Now I want you to notice what happens next in Matthew's account. I've graded out because it's not important for our attention this morning. The next thing is he calls some of the disciples. And I want you to notice the next major event. It says, and Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom. Which kingdom is he preaching about? We already know from Mark. Kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. 
Notice what he does. He's preaching the good news that the kingdom of God is here. It's at hand. He's gone into all the synagogues. He's teaching and preaching. And notice what it says. It says, and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. And his fame went through where? Uh Uh-oh, that's not Israel. It went to Syria. And they brought to him sick people who were afflicted with various diseases, torments, and people who were what? demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. I want you to notice what Jesus just did. Jesus, he says, I'm the anointed one, I am here. The time is fulfilled. Good news, kingdom of God is at hand. Then the next scene we have is him walking over here and grabbing some foreigners, those dogs from Syria, according to the Jew, and he heals them. What? Now, again, you're in 2022. You don't have a clue what that means. You see, if you were in 27 AD, your religious pastors, they would have told you that if you had any kind of sickness, you were cursed by God. Because you've done something to offend the great God. And so you've been struck down, you're afflicted, you're an outcast. That's why you can't walk. Do you remember the disciples asking the question? Why can't that guy walk? Why is he blind? Who sinned? That was their understanding. The very first thing Jesus does after he identifies that he is the promised one, he goes and he heals people. And Mark, uh, sorry, Matthew makes a point of saying, and by the way, he healed demon-possessed people. You see, in that time period, you were cursed by God if you were sick, and you are under the control of the devil. That's why you got possessed. And you know what the solution was in 27 AD? Out of the city. Get away from the home. Get them away from society. Jesus shows up, and what's he supposed to be doing? He's the promised king. What's the next thing he's supposed to do? Rescue and redeem. He doesn't go and battle with the Romans. He doesn't battle with any earthly power. He goes straight to Satan himself. Man, you guys are so hard to get an amen out of. (laughs) I want to show you what the Pharisees thought about this. Jesus healing demons, what the Pharisees say. Mark puts it this way in chapter 1, verse 27. Then they were all amazed, more so than you. They were amazed. So they questioned among themselves saying, what's this? What new teaching is this? For with authority, what does he do? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey. Now you're getting it. The promised king has said, I am him. The time is fulfilled. I'm here. The kingdom of God is here. And to show you, I am going to go not to the Romans, not to those pesky little Caesars, not to any past power, not to any future power. I am going to Satan himself and I'm putting him in his place. And I'm going to deliver those who he has afflicted. He has held in bondage. He who has made them sick. You remember the woman who was bent over for all those years? He unbent her and he said, it was the devil that did that. Friends, they were shocked that this guy had the power to rescue and redeem from Satan. You think your politicians are messed up? They probably are. That's nothing. The person sitting in behind your ear right now, not the physical person. That's the real enemy. He's the real one who's trying to pull you away from Jesus, pull you away from your spouse, pull you away from your parents. That's the enemy. And Jesus says, I've come to rescue and redeem from him. Amen. All right, let's keep moving. Number three, if he is the promised king, if he has come to rescue and redeem, the next thing he should do is he should lift up the law, the constitution of heaven. This is the next thing that the promised one should do. Notice what the Bible says. We've just read this passage in Mark chapter 4. Notice verse 25. 
Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Who is the multitude that's following him? The people who have been rescued. You want people to follow you in your, into, your, into your small groups? Go out and rescue them from their physical afflictions. That's why we have a health message. That's why it's called the what arm? That's the strength. Because Jesus went out, showed them that he cares about their physical needs, and then pointed them to the cross. And we're scratching our heads going, how do we connect with people? Come on. Go and look for people and find their needs. Thank you, Adra, that story. Thank you for that. Thank you for churches that care about people. Go out and do what Jesus did. Watch this. So there's a great multitude now following Jesus, right? Notice the very next verse. You know the Bible didn't have chapters, right? You know that. Yes or no? Well, now you know. Chapter 5, verse 1. Notice the very next word. And seeing the multitude. Who's seeing it? Jesus. It says, he went up onto a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the... What? What's he talking about? I've got good news. The good news is about the kingdom. Anyone poor in spirit can be in the kingdom of heaven. Then he goes on. By the way, most of you... I'm not being... Uh, anyway, I'll say it anyway. It doesn't matter. I'm leaving on Sunday anyway. Um, most of us, have you ever been to someone's bathroom in someone's house, like a Christian's house, and you sit down on the toilet? I'm not trying to be graphic here, but you sit down, the door is shut, and you look up, and you see the Beatitudes on the back of the toilet door. Have you ever seen that? I have. And thank you for putting it there, because it reminds me of it, but that's what we've sort of put the Beatitudes as. It's a nice little poetry. It's not poetry. It's Jesus teaching the constitutional lesson of civics of heaven. The very first thing he teaches them is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. They should be comforted. Meek shall inherit the earth. And down, down, how we go. And so we get to verse 10. He says, blessed are those who, what? Are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the? Now, let me ask you a question. If the kingdom of heaven has come, Jesus is the promised one. He's showing up. He's got power to rescue and redeem from sin, Satan, and death. If he shows up, why is he now telling us that we might be persecuted? But don't worry, because the kingdom of heaven is yours. Why is he saying that? I'll give you one reason, since you're a little bit quiet. Because the kingdom problem has not yet been finished. What do I mean by that? When Jesus shows up, he's invading earth. Because earth is claimed to be the kingdom of the prince of this world. Because he stole the title from Adam. And so when Jesus shows up, he's invading. Amen. Amen. And he says, the kingdom of God is at hand or near, some translations will say. Then he goes straight into the wilderness and he's a showdown with the devil himself. And the devil and him have been showdowning for those three and a half years, right down to the cross where the devil thinks he won. And so Jesus says, listen, it's not over yet. I'm here. The kingdom of God is here, but it's not over yet. There's some stuff to go down yet. But don't worry. The kingdom of heaven is safe. Your name's in it. So he continues on. By the way, this is the Sermon on the Mount, in case you didn't know where we were at to. This is the longest teaching of Jesus in the entire Gospels. Three chapters, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Jesus lays out the complete civics lesson of the kingdom of heaven. What is it like to be a subject in heaven? What isn't it like to be a subject in heaven? So you can choose. Yeah, my, my amazing, beautiful, wonderful wife that you haven't met, she came from another country, from Europe. And when she became an, into Australia, she had to become an Australian citizen. And they made her study all sorts of things to become an Australian citizen. It was really amazing because they told my wife that she had to know the difference between the colour of the seats in the House of um, Com oh, not Commons. That's not us, what are we? Uh, what do we call it? Anyway, lower house, upper house, Senate and... What's, I, I fail it, what is it? House of Representatives, there you go. I've been in too many countries. So she had to be able to say that, by the way, I'll ask you, what's the colour in the lower house? And the top? 
You're all Australians. Congratulations. <laughs> There's the civics lesson right there. But with Jesus, he wanted to show us what it's like to be a subject in heaven. So he continues on. Notice what he says. I'm telling you something. Till heaven and earth passes away, not one uh, jot or title will, or tittle will be moved. From, oh, man, anyway, let's start again. Not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from what? Come on now. From what? The law till all is fulfilled. Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so to do will be called least in the? Why? Because this is the constitution of heaven. Do you know that you have a legal mandated um, weekly day off in heaven's constitution? You knew that, right? It's today. <laughs> Notice this. He says, For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, listen, heaven's different to what you're used to. You're, you're settled for second best down here. What we're going to have in the kingdom of God surpasses all of that. It's going to be amazing. And they're sitting there going, what, wow, what, what, what's going to happen in this place? Jesus moves on. I'm not going to read all this. You go home and read it this afternoon after the meeting. In verse 21, he says, listen, you've heard things like this. Don't kill people. Don't get out a knife and stab them. Don't do that. I'm saying that's good, but don't hate your fellow church board member. Oh, yeah. Robbie hit the road now, didn't it? <laughs> don't get upset with the person as a different color choice for your church carpet. Oh, we're not stabbing you, but I sure would like to. <laughs> Jesus is saying, heaven is different. We don't even hate in the kingdom of God. We have a spiritual righteousness, not just the outward righteousness. Then he goes on and talks about adultery. He said, listen, I'm glad you're not jumping in from bed to bed to bed to bed. That's great. But in your head, you are. And in heaven, we don't do those sorts of things. That would be great to know that there's none of you looking at my wife going, hmm. I can't control that here, but in heaven, I, God will. Because you'll be a subject of the kingdom of heaven. So he moves on. He talks about, listen, there's some things here to learn about marriage. There's some things here to learn about taking oaths. Then he says things like this. You've heard by your pastors, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what you've heard. But let me tell you how heaven is really like. The kingdom of heaven, what it's really like. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Even if someone did something to you so sinister, like accuse you of being an unjust God, you'll turn your other cheek. It's a beautiful thing in heaven. People are going, wow, we've never heard of this thing. Never seen this sort of place. He goes on and he says, listen, love your enemies. You've heard, you know, you've heard the opposite. I'm telling you something different. The place that I have come to lay the foundation for as the kingdom of God is amazing. He goes on and he says, listen, anyway, you, you can read this this afternoon, running out of time here. Chapter 6, he talks about um, don't just do things for the sake of pleasing the tax man. You know, some people give great big offerings because they want a tax deductible status. Nothing wrong with using that. But if that's your motive, that's not what the kingdom of God is about. Look what he goes on and says. He talks about prayer. He's talking to all the, 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 the outcasts of Israel as well. Remember, they've come over, they've been healed, now they're on the mountain. And I want you to notice what Jesus says. He says, here's how I want you to pray. Don't pray like all these vain people who just like say things because they think it impresses everybody. Don't do that. Here's what I want you to pray. Notice, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, what? Your kingdom come. Your will be done where? That's what Jesus is teaching us. That the constitution of heaven that is so perfect, so beautiful, so amazing, so peaceful, so harmonious, we should be praying for that to be in our homes, be in our churches. It is the saddest thing when we multiply our churches because we can't get along with each other. That's not church growth. That's division and conquer. We should be, love, like, I like your little thing here. It says, if we love each other, everyone will know that we are his disciples. Amen? Amen. Some of you didn't say that, need to say it again, so that you know that it applies to you too. So Jesus goes on, he says, listen, 
We want to pray that God's kingdom will come, not just to this planet, because it will, whether you're ready or not, it will come. But he wants it in your heart. He wants it in your home. He wants it amongst your children. And then he goes on and says, listen, but yours is the kingdom and the power. Can you notice that everything Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount is about the kingdom? That's his point. He's teaching that third point. And then he makes this interesting statement. He says, no one can serve two kings. Some of us here today, we're here. Praise the Lord. I'm so grateful that you've come. But some of you today are sitting in your chair with one hand bowing down to the king of kings and another one to the not so king of kings. And I don't know what the other one is, but whatever it is, you can't have both kings. It's not possible. You won't be happy. In fact, Revelation chapter 3, later, see, it calls you miserable, poor, blind, naked. And then he says wretched at the beginning. So Jesus is painting it out. And then he comes, listen, don't worry. Don't worry what this world has. Don't worry what they're going to throw at you. Don't worry. Because if you seek first what? The kingdom of God. Why should your absolute focus be in your life? God's kingdom. I'm I'm glad someone, you know, didn't answer me. What's the number one focus of our lives? What's it supposed to be? The kingdom of God. The what? Kingdom of God. Jesus says, put that first and what will happen? Everything else falls into place. Are you putting God's kingdom first in your choice for what job you're taking, what relationship you're in, what car you're buying, what house you're buying, what house you're selling, whatever you're doing, are you putting God first? Because that's what Jesus teaches kingdom of heaven's like. Let's move on. After Jesus finishes all of this, he keeps going. It's a very long sermon, longer than mine, so you're lucky. You get to the end of it, And in verse 28 of chapter 7, it says, And so it was when Jesus had ended his sayings that the people were astonished. They were shocked at what heaven or the kingdom of God is like. They were shocked. Why? Because he was teaching them like one that had authority, not as the scribes. He was teaching them as one who knew what he was talking about. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, you tell me what word does it say after this. It says, I I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. What's the next word? Okay, there's different translations, obviously. Next word is having. The three angels who are traveling through the midst of air, they possess something. And what is it that they possess? The everlasting gospel. They own it. They experience it. They live it. They possess it. They have authority. And when they teach, when they share, people go, whoa. I'm astonished at what you're saying. Why are we lacking in being a witness for Jesus? Because we're not living it. Amen? Amen. But Jesus continues. These last two are short, so don't get stressed. Jesus has said he is the fulfillment of the prophecy. He is the Messiah. He is the king. He has demonstrated he has power to go straight to the problem in this world, and that is Satan himself. Then he has shown he understands how to restore freedom and justice in a universe by bringing back into the focus of God's character in the context of his law. He understands that. Now, number four, what everyone wants to know is, how do I become a citizen. How do I join this kingdom? How, I, how do you know you're in the kingdom right now? The kingdom's come. Are you in the kingdom? Well, I'm glad that uh, the Bible records it. You ever heard this story about Nicodemus? Notice the, notice the words that you don't notice before. It says, there was a man called Phar- oh, the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night. You know this part. He says, Jesus, we know that you must come from God. You're a great teacher because no one can do the miracles that you're doing except they come from God. We, yeah, I see something here, Jesus. Jesus turns directly to a descendant of Abraham who should have access to the kingdom by birth. Jesus turns to him, and you should know these words very well. In verse 3, it says, Jesus said to him, listen, 
most assuredly, I love how the old King James says it, because that's how I first learned it. It said, verily, verily, truly, truly, I'm telling you, double point. Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is, what? Born again, he cannot see, what? Ah, oh. so how do you become a subject of the kingdom of God? You have to be born again. That's your citizenship ceremony. That's how it happens. That's your adoption into a new family, a new kingdom, a new father. You're a new child. It happens through being born again. Ask yourself, don't answer this. Ask yourself this. Are you born again this morning? If you don't know whether you are or not, you need to talk to your pastor. And again, if they don't know, you talk to the president. Because this is the criteria to be in the kingdom. It's not being a generational advance. I'm talking to all, all my... Oh, look, I'm not that old. You're a bit younger than me. and I'm talking to you. Just because mum and dad are Seventh-day Adventists or were Seventh-day Adventists and grandma was a missionary in Fiji or Papua New Guinea, wherever else they went, that means nothing in terms of you being a subject of the kingdom. It's a good start. It's a good environment. Praise God for good Christian homes and good Christian examples. But you need to take the, um, the, the decision to be a part of that kingdom yourself. And so you can. Jesus says this, listen, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe is condemned. Baptism is not equal to born again. It's a part of it. But being born again is a completely changed family. You've changed from the family of Satan to the family of God. That's how John calls it, not me. So Jesus teaches us how to become subjects. We need to be born again. And the last point here, and this is the, the last one before you go to have your lunch. The last one's the place. Jesus says, listen, I'm the promised king. I'm the Messiah. I'm the anointed one. I have the power to rescue and redeem you. No matter what you are addicted to, what your problem is in life, what your challenges are, I have the power to rescue and redeem you. And then I want to show you another option. Don't keep living in this kingdom down here. Live in this kingdom. It's so much better. We're supposed to say, how do I sign up? He says, I'm glad you asked. Be born again. Let the Spirit of God move in your heart and let you be born again and join my kingdom. And then this is probably the greatest point. The little group I had the Bible study with this morning, um, was it Ronnie? Ronnie over there? He said, and he didn't even know I was going to preach on this. He said, this is my favorite verse because the Sabbath school guy gave this verse. Notice this. If I can click this thing. Notice what it says. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Why? Come on, why? Because I'm going to prepare what? A place. For who? No one said it right. There it is. It's a place for me. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for Robbie in the kingdom. And you should say amen to that. Because I was once lost, but now I'm found. Amen. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you. The James of the world, the Bobs of the world, the Peters, whatever else your names are. Jesus has a place prepared for you in his kingdom. He wants you to know, listen... I've been to some of these things before and they get real fancy and it embarrasses me, but they have little name cards and they put it in the front right there at that seat normally and it says, Robbie Bergen, the speaker. And it embarrasses me because I think of that passage where Jesus says they want the high seats and they want their name. I don't want any seat. I'll sit over there. I'll sit there. I don't care. But in heaven, it's different because God said to Jesus, go prepare in places. So he's prepared this great mansion with all these different rooms and every place has a name place on it. And your name's there, and your name's there, and your name's there. And it's up to you whether you take him up on the invitation. He has the power to save you. He can show you what life will be like with him. He can show you how to be a part of his kingdom by being born again. But you have to choose. That's what Jesus is saying to us today. He says, I've got good news. The kingdom of God is here. I'm the Messiah. I've got the power. I've got the, the, the freedom. I've got the way in. I've got the place. What's your choice? 
Friends, when we talk about the gospel, what we're saying, hang on, go back to here. We're saying this. The gospel is five things. Jesus is the promised king. He has the power to rescue and redeem us. He, uh, he brings back freedom and justice with the law of God. He, he calls us to be his subjects and he's prepared a place for us. If you can share those five points to your next door neighbor and connect with them, you're sharing the gospel. They might say, hey, Robbie, how do you know that he's the promised one? I'm so glad you asked. My church actually has a whole bunch of Bible studies that talk about how to prove that Jesus is historical, that Jesus fulfills all the Messianic prophecies. Happy to share with you. Okay, so Jesus proves, you've proved that Jesus is the historical character. You can prove that he came right on time according to the Messianic prophecies. But what's he trying to rescue and redeem us from? You see, this is the biggest problem I think we have. We don't let people understand what sin is. And if I don't know what sin is, why would I ever want to be saved? So your friend tells you, hey, I don't, I don't understand. Why did he come and rescue and redeem? How did he rescue and redeem? Well, he died on a cross. Why? Because of sin. What's sin? Well, it's the rule of law that's been broken. Well, I don't like laws. Isn't that bondage? Well, most laws are bondage, but this one actually gives you rest. So it's not bondage. It gives you peace of mind. It gives you freedom and assures justice. Wow, how do I become a part of this? You be born again. And by the way, neighbor, Jesus loves you so much. God loves you so much that there's a place with your name on it waiting for you. Just try that. Connect with people. All right, let's finish this up. Here we go. I'm going to skip this one because I can see you're getting very hungry. I'm going to go to this one. On the last week of Jesus' life on earth before his death and resurrection, his disciples come to him and say, Jesus, can you tell us what the signs will be of the end of the world and the return of your second coming, in essence? And Jesus goes through and says, well, first of all, listen, there will be earthquakes, there will be floods, there will be famines, there will be false Christs, there will be false prophets, there will be wars, rumors of wars. And then he says, but none of these are the end. Did you hear what I said? Jesus said they're the beginning of sorrow. You see, the disciples asked a very important question, which we all don't get when we read it. They said, show us the, or tell us the sign. What word did I say? Do you know what we normally read when we read that? signs. And so then we work out if we can calculate how many earthquakes there have been and how many floods and famines and deaths and wars, then we know somehow that Jesus is coming soon. But they only ask for the sign. And so Jesus says, look, it's going to get bad before it gets better. But here's the sign. It's on the screen. You know this passage well. Jesus says this. And this gospel, the good news, of the what? Which kingdom is he talking about? Of God or heaven? will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then what? This is what Jesus' last point to his disciples were before he died on the cross. He said, you take the message that I'm the king. I have the power to rescue and redeem from Satan, sin and death. That I have the only real peace and um, happiness that this universe will ever know, the, my constitution. And tell them how to become part of it. And tell them I've got a place prepared. You tell the whole world that, and then this is what it basically reads as. When the world will hear the good news that Jesus or the King has come to rescue and redeem, and the kingdom has a constitution that brings justice and freedom and is looking for people to be citizens and to dwell in his territory, then the end will come. Not before doesn't matter if COVID, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, or epsilon, whatever, omega. I'm waiting for omega. But whenever they come, none of that is the sign. Are you with me? doesn't matter who your prime minister is in this country. It makes no difference to me because my only job and your only job as faithful followers of Jesus is to take the gospel of the kingdom to all the world, starting with your neighbor. Amen? All right. Friends, I want to pray for you. Father in heaven, 
Bless my friends. They have been through a lot. And if anyone needs to know the power of, of Jesus as the rescue and redeemer is my brothers and sisters here in Victoria. And I pray that as they mingle with their neighbours and as they mingle with their, their, their Woolies and Coles and Audi shopping attendants and as they have their haircuts around the place and as they do all these various things around where they live, I pray that you would give them opportunity to connect with people and to share these five things about Jesus and the good news. Please bless them. Strengthen them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, Faith FM is all about connecting Australia with the life-changing gospel. As my friends are getting ready here, I want to tell you a story about this guy. His name's Heath, and it's not his real name. I'm calling him Heath. He lives in Adelaide. I met him just a few months ago. He is Lebanese origin. He's driving his car in Adelaide, and he's skipping through the radio stations, and all of a sudden, he comes across this station, Faith FM. The very first things he hears on Faith FM, and you and I know that this would be the wrong thing to give someone the first time, but God apparently doesn't know what we know. The very first thing this guy heard on his radio was this sentence. The Sabbath was not made for Jews only, but for all of humanity. That was the first thing Heath heard on the radio. He's Lebanese. He lives across the, the River Jordan there on the other side of where Israel is. And he had grown up his whole life going, they're nutters over there. They have this Sabbath thing. They're a bunch of crazies. Over here, we've got the right day. We've got the right way, the great God, all that business. But when he heard this, he had never heard this sentence before. You all know that sentence. They, he heard it for the first time. He was troubled. He went home. He was listening to his voice playing over and over again. Sabbath is not for the Jews only. It's for the whole world. It's for the whole world. So he gets on the internet and he Googles, where's the Sabbath Christians in Adelaide? He finds a Seventh-day Adventist church comes up, praise the Lord for Google. He gets on, he drives up to, the, up to the church, he gets in, he sits down. And the person who made the comment on the radio is the person that gets up to preach. He said, I can't believe this. He stayed there and he studied with that pastor for about eight, nine months. Now he is a Seventh-day Adventist. He invited me the other day to go to Adelaide and to visit with the Lebanese community there. And he came and told me privately, he said, listen, they are all my relatives and they believe that they are children of Abraham through Ishmael. You're over here and you'll believe that you are children, that the promise came through Isaac. But God is showing me that my job is to bring these two together. He wants to take his family on the journey to find being a son of God, a son of through Jesus. We love sharing the gospel, and I hope you'd well too.